drive here at Top Dirt Hall over the Parkway High School and across the interstate. And today it's not talk with Mike and Tom, but rather uh, we, ref we are going to have a visit from a noted international scholar. Uh, but before I introduce him, I want to introduce several guests. First, in the uh, back of the auditorium here is Ophir Averon, the, the Consul General for the Southeast from Israel, so we want to recognize him. Also, the Director of Academic Affairs for the Consulate, Shelley Castaldi. Uh, a quick word on Shelley when I called the uh, consulate to communicate about this visit. Uh, you know, I had seen her name, Shelley Castaldi, and I knew she worked at the Israeli uh, consulate for the Southeast, and I expected an accent, but I did not get the accent I expected. You must talk to her and hear her beautiful London accent. It's just, uh, she is originally from Great Britain. So, anyway, we welcome Shelley, and she is certainly a wonderful colleague to have here. Our, uh, our guest for today is first a, uh, a faculty member at uh, the University of Jer uh, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He is in the same field that Lenore Gillum and Baltimore and I and other colleagues are in, counseling foundations and leadership area. He has uh, chaired the Department of Education at that university and is presently on sabbatical where he most recently returns from a a uh, visit to his native country of Peru. Now, our guest this afternoon is faced with a, a career decision that many great faculty members are faced with, and that is whether to remain full-time in the classroom or whether to step into the role of full-time administration. I can tell you, yeah, <laughs> oh, I can tell you those decisions are fraught with difficulties and ultimately you have to decide which kind of service you're, you're called to. Our guest this afternoon is an expert in, in multiple areas and a renowned, truly renowned international scholar. His publication list I began to run on my computer this morning and quite frankly, five minutes later, it was still running. I was jealous and impressed. But let me say that he, uh, among his areas, and he has experience in secondary education, in secondary education counseling, he's been out there in the field with teenagers, he's taught graduate students, you name it, he's done it. But ultimately, he is a renowned expert in the area of diversity and also tied to the idea of creativity. He is presenting some of those ideas this afternoon, not just here at Columbus State, but internationally being web streamed. And of course, anybody who is on COEHP-TV, we record them and show them over and over and over again. And there'll be finally something to replace uh, TMT. <laughs> I want to introduce you to Dr. Moshi Tatar. Thank you so much for the introduction. As my mother said once to me, after your introduction, I shouldn't speak at all, you know? <laughs> I should say, thank you for coming, and that's all. And, and maybe send you my CV, you know, from <laughs> email and enough. Thank you so much. The, this visit to Columbus State University is great, has been great from the morning. What a incredible campus here and your downtown campus what incredible institution all my congratulations and all my uh, higher and, and higher uh, qualifications and qualifications um, I, I was born in Peru and I immigrated to Israel 31 years ago and I just returned from Peru so if I if you hear some dramatic expressions or something like that. So it's still the influence of speaking Spanish for the last, you know, two weeks and seeing so much telenovelas, soaps, and, uh, you know, so programs <laughs> as for, and it's nice. Um, the issue that I would like to address this afternoon is composed by two main topics. 
And since we are limited in the time that we have always, I will only refer to some aspects in each of these huge topics. One of them is the development of talent and creativity. And the second, what are the meanings of working in multicultural settings? And I won't go into the theories of creativity and talent development and so forth, uh, but I will stress the point about what I really believe and is the relationship that can be set between working, studying, living in multicultural settings and the possibility that in these multicultural, that these multicultural settings will improve, will encourage the, develop, the development of different talents and the development of creativity. And since your country and my country are basically countries where people from so many cultures live together. Your university, my university, students coming from different parts, from the same country, from abroad. This is a huge opportunity to take these multicultural settings and to develop within these multicultural settings more creativity and more kinds of talents with children, with adolescents and also with students. And when I say talents, I don't want only to refer about academic talents. Because we have, you know, like an automatic way to see things in many universities. Academic, you know, we like the, that idea. Cognitive related talents and so forth. But there are so many other kinds of talents and there are so many other ways and other topics and other fields where creativity can be and is relevant in our life that I would like to encourage all of us this afternoon to think about how in our multicultural settings we can encourage the development of a variety of talents and the development of creativity. So let's begin saying something about creativity. And, and I'm not going you know, into the theory, so I took some quotes only to try to develop with you some of these ideas. Eric Fromm, you know, very important psychologist, said once, wrote once, creativity requires the courage to let go of certainties. And, and I must say, we like a certain life. We like to be in control. We like to know what is going to happen today and tomorrow and tonight. We want to prepare everything. We want to know how to what will be the topics of our final examinations. We, we want to know exactly what will be our duties when we will be school counselors working at schools. We want control, we want certainty, and that's okay. But creativity can challenge the way that we look at the world. And the thing that we need to deal with is our basic basic fear of, fail, of failure, the feeling that, wow, if we are going to do something a little bit different, maybe it won't work. Okay. So what? Instead of that, I would like to suggest you not to be threatened by the idea that maybe we are going to try some new things to do some different ways to do the things that we're used to do in specific ways and to try to fight our desire to live in our in a personal life that is so certain secure uh, and planned the second thing edward de bono one of the most important developers of the idea of creativity of and divergent thinking if you know you know convergent thinking divergent thinking once he said and it's so nice. It is better to have enough ideas for some of them to be wrong than to be always right by having no ideas at all. <laughs> I won't comment. It's enough. You know, it's, it, it speaks by itself. Okay? But what threatens our desire? And we have that desire. I can see in your eyes. We have that desire to make things a little bit different or really different. 
in, in our life, in the lives of our students, in, 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 in the way that we write, in the way that we work as professionals, and so forth. There are so many things that stop us within organizations, within our families, within our personality traits and, and structure that, doesn't, that do not allow us to even try to be a little more creative today. For example, and I'm not you know, saying that I have all the answers, how many times have we heard from others or from ourselves? No? I'm not saying you're wrong, but you know, maybe next time. Now's not the right time. You know, it's so nice. So when is the right time? You know? okay. Good thought, but impractical. You know? And I, I can quote you know, Donald Super, Supers. So many people have, you know, a, 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 the next quote is like, you know, there is nothing more practical than a good theory. So that's really, if you have a good theory, you can, you know, that's very practical. Fourth, let's give it more thought. We did all right without it before. Why to try? And, and the one that I, you know, put it in bold because I have heard it, but in Hebrew, okay? <laughs> let's form a committee, you know. Let's think about that. Let's all sleep on it, you know. And maybe you, we do not need to wake up. We need to sleep on it a little more to take some pills, you know, to really sleep on it, you know. Okay. So these are the ways that people, you know, speak about how not to be creative and how to be certain but, uh, you know, doing again and again what once uh, many um, people said and Wickland, you know, the great, 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 great psychologist said, doing more of the same, that's good, you know, more of the same. We are so sure that we are doing okay. Maybe we are not doing okay, but we know what we are doing. <laughs> so let's do it again. And again, and again. Okay. Now, from one side, you have all the ideas of creativity and talent development. From the other side, we have really the challenge of living in plural societies. And I would like to, to make a, you know, a, a, to, to try to explain a difference between, uh, it, at least in the way that I conceptualize that, be, between what is a plural society and what is a multicultural society. Okay. A plural society is composed of, by a variety of cultures and, or cultural groups. You know. We here are in a plural meeting, in a plural class. People came here from different cultures, from different backgrounds. That's all. But it doesn't make us to be multicultural. It doesn't make immediately this class to be multicultural. Because multicultural is a policy, a way to see the plural groups as those that respect and encourage cultural retention as part of the norms of the group, of the institution, of the class. So the most important condition for developing a multicultural organization class, etc., is having a plural class, a plural group. It's okay, but it's not enough. Now we need to do many other things so that we will develop together a multicultural setting, a multicultural organization. And it's, it, it's really a challenge. It's not something that you can say, okay, you have people from many cultures, okay, uh, maybe they, they can play together soccer or football or something, okay, that, okay, they, they're doing multicultural work. No, they are playing, they are doing some kind of plural work, but to be multicultural is a challenge that you need to invest, to develop, and to work through up to the state or to the stage that you really feel that you are encouraging cultural retention and expression of the different backgrounds inside as an input to the class, to the institution, to the organization. And in my country, you know, Israel, you know, being different culturally, you know, culturally different, is not an issue that is so easy, you know, to, to pick. It's like, okay, I was born in Peru, okay, and I live in Israel. Shelley was born in, in London, in Britain, and she lives in Israel. Offer was born in Israel, and he lives in Israel. So, 
if we come together <laughs> so if we come together our uh, our driver bruce he was born in the states and, and he lived in the states so we were together you know for two and a half hours driving from atlanta and so we were in the car with a plural car we were not a multicultural car okay and uh, it's interesting because you know the way that people look at you and identify you like two years ago i was going into a mall in um, in Israel and in every mall, you know, there are security guards, you know, checking whatever you bring. And it doesn't matter if you were born in Israel, in Peru, in Britain, and, you know, everyone is going to be checked. So he checked, you know, my suitcase, okay. And he said to me something in Russian, and he said something. And I answered to him, you know, in Hebrew. And, uh, and I said to him in Hebrew, I will translate that for you. I think that is better. <laughs> and I said to him in Hebrew, I'm sorry, but I don't understand Russian. He looked at me with a very angry face. And he said in Hebrew, why are you so mad about our culture? Why don't you speak Russian? Why are you ashamed to be what you are? And I told him, I'm Peruvian. <laughs> I'm, that's the only reason. But why his question was addressed to me like that? Because I look in Israel until the moment that I open my mouth and everyone can hear my <clears throat> very exciting uh, uh, Spanish accent pronunciation. <laughs> I look like a Russian. So he has his right, you know, like, okay, you're Russian, I will, you know. So even this conversation between me and between the security guard was not a multicultural meeting. It was a plural meeting <laughs> and a cultural misunderstanding, of course, of course. I, I, I was able to tell him, yes, 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 I'm going now to, you know, to learn Russian only so that, you know, <laughs> and I'm sorry that I forgot all my Russian. I, I, I was ready to do uh, almost anything. So this difference between a plural society and multicultural society are very important. And we, we, must, we must look at the different contexts that affect, that are related to the development and to understanding of multiculturalism, but they are also relevant to, for the understanding of the development of talents and the development of creativity. And there are three contexts. First of all, is the ideological and national context. What are the ideas? What are the stereotypes? What kind of budget is allocated for the different ideas? What are the policies? And I think that it's enough. And uh, all my examples will be relevant for, on, in, to some extent to your reality and some of yours to my reality. But that's the ideological, the national policy, allocation of resources, and so forth. If you want to promote multiculturalism, you need to plan, and you need to allocate the resources so that you can encourage cultural enc encounters between different groups and giving multicultural contents to classes, to schools, to universities. Second, at the second level, is the way academic and professional, and I'm speaking about university and colleges, the ways that we prepare our school counselors, our teachers, the ways that we train them. What are the values that they are taking from these institutions to their work? If we teach them only through the lens of monocultural theories, and then we expect of them to be great with multicultural classes. Oh, this is a gap that they are not able, you know, to feel, f to feel it alone. If we mean that we want to develop multicultural awareness, multicultural knowledge, multicultural skills, and you know all the, you know, all the elements in school counseling, in psychology, in training teachers. So we need to offer them the opportunities to be trained, to know, to feel, to learn the different kinds and the different um, uh, topics. Third, at the level of the institution itself, 
it's nice. I have been prepared with multicultural competences. I go into a school with a monocultural curriculum with only one way to do things. So the organizational culture of the specific school, of the specific institution, affects really and in, in very important ways the existing the possibility that a multicultural setting will exist or will prevail or not. And the same with creativity and the development of talents. You need an ideological national context that will promote that. You need an academic and professional training and preparation that will promote that. I have visited the, your downtown campus. It's impressive. You have the infrastructure. You have done a, a great work. Now you need to attract the students and to attract the faculty or to continue to attract students, continue to attract the faculty. So that in practice you will you will use you will take advantage of what you have advanced and, and in, in buildings and in, in programs and in curriculum and the same at the uh, level of the school now I want to say so that it will be clear multicultural settings are main maybe the best context for developing creativity and the development of different talents. And that will be my main message, and I will develop it in the following minutes. You, we have organizations from many kinds. OK, sorry. OK, we have organizations from many kinds. You know, we have what we call monocultural organization. I don't know if you know an organization that, that looks like this. Excludes members of specific groups? Maybe not. That's not political correct now. OK. Implicitly and explicitly, explicitly supports a specific kind of culture. <clears throat> I know. I know some. No? The dominant culture, the values of some group that is the dominant culture, maybe. There are monocultural organizations. There are non-discriminatory organizations. That is organization that show an organization that shows greater tolerance toward other groups that the climate is less hostile to other uh, cultural groups, that recognizes that there are problems among members of different cultures when they come together, but it's, that's all. That's the stage of the organization. And eventually, there are multicultural organizations, organizations that values cultural diversity in the organization, understands and supports. It's not enough theory, understands? and support. That is cognitive behavior. Okay. The contribution of cultural pluralism to reach common and even higher achievements. I don't know, like 10 or 12 years ago, my family visited the Coca-Cola you know, industry you know, in Atlanta. What a visit. And my son you know, was so happy that at the end you know, of your visit, you can taste Coke you know, from any kinds of country and he went to the Israeli coke and he said mm, I know that I know that and then you know he walked he was 10 years old and he tasted the Chinese coke so sweet that he said how can they drink that and so forth and so forth when we were talking about my daughter was very impressed you no know? she doesn't say say that in that in the words that I'm quoting but she meant that look puppy how they are culturally sensitive Every culture, every country with, with its own taste. And I said, yes, they are cultural sensitive, but that's the only way to sell coke <laughs> in China, to sell coke in Israel, and to sell, uh, I don't know, in other places. So we can be culturally sensitive and creative when we need to do like because we need to sell, because we need to encourage something. And that's okay. That's great. But we can we don't need to wait to the situations that we need to take advantage of some kind of selling or so forth. We can try to encourage that from the beginning. At least it's a kind of adventure that it it, it it's worth it to take, okay? Because it pays, and it pays good. 
There are many approaches toward diversity, okay? And, and I will say it, uh, you know, briefly and very, you know, and quickly, you know. Approaches like those uh, developed by Osley and others, you know, that divide the diversity, the approaches to diversity and compare be between a progressive approach to diversity, equity, access, and support for diverse groups, as compared to a much more conservative, you know, approach where meritocracy or seeing diversity as a conflict and so forth. A second, no, just a second, okay. A second approach toward diversity that tries to analyze from the perception of human resource, okay? The ideas of how to compare. You, can, you cannot see what is written there. That's okay, that was the idea, that you will be <laughs> impressed by the idea that I'm quoting people and they will say, wow, my God, how many theories did he have? Okay. Uh, Okay, <laughs> the idea is, okay, the strat strategic responses, the different strategic responses of an organization toward diversity. To be reactive, to be de defensive, to be accommodative, or to be proactive. Okay, and I'm sorry. The third, and even though I, you cannot see that, it's enough, it's enough, it's a very well-known model, I'm sorry, please, <laughs> please. That's the model of Olvino and Sue, all the um, people that have studied um, counseling and so forth. Okay, please. Multicultural organization development, the idea that you go from a monocultural organization to a multi, through a multicultural education uh, setting. Okay, what are the steps that you need to take? And this idea is great, but it's supposed, it, you know, it's the, the main um, uh, idea is that all organizations will go from being monocultural to being multicultural. No, no, no. That's the ideal. That's the, you know, the, I don't know, the illusion. But most of them are not there. A fourth model and, uh, is, you know, and it's only, I, I wanted to show you only this part, a model that we developed in Israel with my very good friend and colleague, Gabi Orenchik about four kinds of attitudes that we found also in the military and also at, in schools by interviewing teachers and interviewing soldiers and interviewing officers and principals and so forth. Four kinds of attitudes that people have, officers and professionals, toward diversity. And we saw, really, we were able to identify four attitudes, okay? The most frequent one was the one that thinks about diversity as a problem, okay? What are we going to do in, that, in this class that we have two Mexicans in class? How are we going to resolve the problem? It's like they, they are a problem, okay? We need to resolve, you know? And I can make the same, you know, the, the, the same uh, examples with our immigrants and so forth. So, so uh, we're going to resolve the problem by translating something, giving them to read something in Spanish or so forth. But there is a problem we need to solve. Okay, okay. that's a responsive way, but are we, are, are, are we missing something? You know, we are looking at, at the, this diversity as a disadvantage, like, you know, okay. Second is the idea, nice idea, that diversity may be a challenge, something that can be used for the development of new things, of different things. Third, the one that I like the most, but it's like, you know, I also like sugar and chocolate and I cannot eat too much. So it's like one thing that I like that we saw in some organizations, but in too few, in too few institutions. That is to look at the diversity as an asset and say, we have here a plural group. We give the, the, the support to express different ideas. How can we take advantage of this diversity so that it will be an asset for our school, for our university, for our group? And fourth, the attitude that was the most intriguing one was one that we call it a non-issue attitude. And it was so nice. Uh, we were interviewing a principal about the number of immigrants that he have or something like that, and he said, <coughs> Why are you asking? Are there any problems? Have you heard any problems? And I said, no, but I wanted to see how many you have, what are you doing? And it was, it's okay. 
So why to, what do you say? Why to raise the issue? Or like we say in Hebrew, don't open your mouth. Don't open your mouth, you know. Because if you open your mouth afterwards, now it will be an issue. <laughs> what? It will be a problem that we need to solve. And uh, this attitude of non-issue is very, you know, it's very appealing. It's like, you know, I treat all of them equal. Although these immigrants do not understand me, they don't, <laughs> their parents do not come to school, they don't know, you know, but excellent. Non-issue, like, shh, shh. Yeah, okay. No one has, you have any claim about that? Are you complaining? No, no, no. So why? You know, it's something like that. These are main attitudes. I would like to convince you that it's worthy to try to, to understand diversity as a challenge, if not as an asset, as, but of course as, an, as a challenge. In, I don't have enough time. In um, one investigation that we did with uh, teachers, okay, interviewing te teachers, Israeli teachers, about their views regarding multiculturalism. And these were more than 400 teachers working in schools with higher percentages of immigrants studying there. And only two findings. One, we asked them whether they support pluralism or assimilation. Assimilation is, you know, that every immigrant ASAP will be Israeli or will be American. Okay? And pluralism in the way of multiculturalism, giving them the right to express, to reflect their cultures. And the incredible thing that we did, we found, was that when they were speaking in general about the Israeli society, most of them, the teachers, said and claimed, yeah, we support pluralism. Immigrants should express their own views, their different ways to see that. Yeah, why not? But some pages afterwards, you know, the, the ways that we, you know, administer questionnaires, you know, same questions but in different pages so they don't remember what <laughs> you asked them, you know. But several pages afterwards, we asked them the same question but now about your school. Do you support in your class pluralism or assimilation? Look what happened. Most of the teachers said, look, at class, I don't have the time to be culturally sensitive. I don't have the resources to be culturally you know, sensitive, and so forth and so forth. And this kind you know, of difference is like, one is the theory in general in society, and, what, and one is in practice. You know, what are you doing? It's like, who supports multicultural issues? Yes who is teaching in his class, introducing some kind of multicultural topics. It's tough, I don't know, I don't know where, that's the difference. And I will encourage all of us to introduce not only theory, but also in practice, more and more cultural diverse issues. I'm skipping one or two. Okay. Or four. Okay. Uh, two main ideas. One, now trying to go into my main issue. The link between multiculturalism and creativity, and I wrote it very, you know, in a very simple way, and, and so forth. Gregory will suggest the following. And it's so easy, so easy, so simple, but in my opinion, so true. Different culture foster different perceptions. If you have together people coming from different cultures, cultures, in many things, they will think different. In their expressions, in their language, they will express differently to different stimulus. So if you, ha if you have a plural group, a multicultural group, you will get different ideas. Not in everything, not in everything, but in many topics, if you encourage them to talk from their cultural background, you may have and you may hear different perceptions about counseling, about parenting, about uh, uh, art, about. The culture affects not only the context of our thinking, but also influences its processes. The different experiences lead us to think different. Second, different perception foster creativity. Different perception produce or generate many times the need to learn, to change and renew. And these are the two so simple and easy ideas. Gathering together people from different cultures, 
you will get different perceptions. If you organize systematically different perceptions, you can foster creativity. Creativity is not only the way that Picasso and other writers and greaters, you know, that once they have an idea. Creativity is also a daily and daily and daily challenge to solve problems and to encourage different things. And third, the conclusion is diverse cultures foster creativity. At least they have the basic foundation for fostering creativity. Then, through the processes that we know from cognitive psychology, and I don't have the time to go into them, through accommodation, okay, through elaboration, through transformation, you know, all the things that we do with the stimulus when we receive them, and especially transformation, that is the continuous experimentation, making the needed change that you need to do until you have the new product, the different one. And we don't need to be afraid. We are not afraid to fail. It's okay. The recommendations of Waddell are to develop an organizational culture that integrates different cultural values in the same organization. There are main values, but we can add some values. And it's okay. Nothing will happen. To encourage learning through dialogue. Dialogue between people that do not agree. Dialogue between people that do not come from the same culture. It cannot be that one teacher will say, you know, they have all of them the same questions. If you answer to one, everyone said, ah, yeah, yeah, all of, uh, all of them agree. It's like, you know, we like consensus and we like that. No, maybe dialogue. And even more, more important than that, dialogue with people that think different than we feel, than we think. That's okay. And third, to develop and implement a philosophy of synergy, of complementing uh, thoughts from people from different cultures. Second, a second way to see that, that complements the one, is the great work of Angela Leung and her colleagues about how multicultural experience, experiences or experience enhances creativity. We get ideas from other cultures that we didn't know. You know, and even if we don't work with people coming from other cultures, you know, when we travel, you know, abroad, we face so many challenges, you know, or how to do things, or how different cultures relate to different things, that we can learn new ideas, to be open to new ideas, and to develop less conventional thinking. And it's okay. Most of our lives are very conventional. And it's okay. I agree. But here and there, you can begin to change. And really, as teachers, as counselors that work in plural settings, they need to be creative not because it's nice. It's because the only way to work in multicultural settings. Because if you don't work like that, if you are very conventional, maybe you will feel that you are very professional, but you are not relevant to them. And that's the issue. Okay. It's not enough, as I said at the beginning, to be technically exposed to various cultural groups. What is needed is to make the adaptation and to develop the cognitive and behavioral readiness for being open to new experiences. Two things that we, that, that there are great limitations, you know, and we are universities in yours universities, in my universities, and in the different schools, you know, always the tasks that require a clear and single answer, only one answer, you know, not be creative, you know, repeat what I have said in class, because that's the answer, you know, read my lips, you know, exactly what I said, okay. or those limited by time, you know, ah, you want to write more, yeah, yeah, 10 minutes, that's all, you know, so put it all together. Uh, I told you that I, I am Peruvian, so Mario Vargas Llosa, just the last, do you know him? Nobel Prize in Literature, 2010, okay, please. So I quote him in English, you know, and he said something that I really think that he gives the answer for, for all my talk, and is, you cannot teach creativity how to become a good writer, of course not, 
but you can help a young writer discover within himself what kind of writer he would like to be. And the issue is, you cannot teach creativity, but you can try to create the conditions and the context that will encourage such kind or this kind of creativity. The roles of us as professionals in the, in the work of creativity and talent are the following. And it depends what is our role if we are teachers at university, teachers at schools, of parents or parents. First of all, to identify creative and talented children, and not only academically talented, but all the kinds and types of talent. Identifying and to refer to others, of course. We are not the professional that need to take care of them, but we need to identify the characteristics. And or to reinforce specific ways of thinking from our kids, from our students, being more flexible, being more open to new experiences. That's a great way to encourage creativity. Third, to support appropriate context, those that encourage creativity, those that are beyond the limitations that we put on them. Four, opting for a strategy that sees cultural diversity as an asset or an advantage for, our, or for the organization and also as a great base for developing talents and creativity. And last, transforming educational institutions into enterprises that value diversity. And I, I would like to end and to say that I think that this sentence summarizes everything. And next time that I'm invited, if I have only 20 seconds, I will say, OK, read Albert Einstein. It's enough. And he wrote once, and I think that he was great. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift, and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. We need the intuitive mind, and we need the rational mind. They need both of them to work together. We have so many challenges that we face as educators, as parents, as professors that we need both of them. Todaroba, thank you very much. Questions, please. Ah, yeah. There, um, this is, these are the average of their answers, but not the numbers of teachers. Yes. Ah, okay. Uh, really, I don't know how to get. Uh, <laughs> uh, we are going to. Okay. So that, that's the average, you know, that's the average of the responses of the teachers relating to preferring to adopt a plural uh, approach to uh, immigrants that an assimilative one when you speak in terms of general and, you know, all the other way when you speak specifically about what to do in schools, at schools. And I'm not criticizing the teachers because I will answer the same, you know. In principle, diversity is excellent, in practice, it's tough. It's really tough. You need to prepare yourself and to do your best. Please. Yeah, please. Uh, how would you think we would do if you would administer the same survey to this crowd right here? What would be the answer? Yeah, it would be the similar thing. I think that th these yeah. days, I don't want to say, the idea of pluralism, you know, is really politically correct, you know? You don't speak against pluralism. It's like, okay, he, no? That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, do, do you think that? Yeah, Let, let's see. Yeah, yeah, we agree. Why not? Sure. People have the right. I'm not, now I'm not so sure, you know. <laughs> <laughs> people, people are smiling, at, like, like saying, oh, he bought the story. Oh. <laughs> so, so the, the, the practical 
part of the question is, uh, since I do believe that we, we all in principle agree, I think so. And we would, you know, we would have, you know, you know, easy time, you know, agreeing on, yeah. on general ideas. But then I'm not sure how well we would do in, in practicalities, and I'm not sure how able would we be to but implement. I, I, it. But, but, but so, sorry, that I missed a bit. What's your name? Tesla. Tesla. I, I want to tell you something. When you go into practicalities, okay, I'm not saying that it, it's a, or you are 100% multicultural or you are not a multicultural at all. No, it doesn't work like that. Right. But there are specific things that you can do. In your class, for example, some of the contents of your class can be of a kind that stresses multicultural issues. Uh, um, some of the theories that you're presenting to your students here at the university or in your classes can be, you know, examples given different names. You know, one teacher, you know, said to me in Israel, you know, taking the most simple, you know, example, so simple that you are going to say, ah, oh, Moshe, that's not a good example. No, that's a good example. When you write an, uh, an arithmetic, you know, problem that Moshe went to, you know, take a train from A to B, you know, and the other from B to C, you know, when are they going to meet? You, you know, that this kind of, uh, yeah, ah, yeah, okay. In Israel, we don't have enough trains, so it's enough, you know. <laughs> but instead of Moshe, we have so many Russian kids. Can it be once Yuri takes a train and Muhammad, an Arab kid, train? at least you can, intro and that is in the simplest level. Why are always the same names of the dominant culture that you put and introduce in your examples? Not to speak about history or about religion. Knowing others is not a threat. It's a great base for understanding. And as I always said, you can understand and do not agree. That's okay. You don't need to agree to all the, the values of other culture. And the way that you want to show that you don't agree is not to know and not to understand even a little bit about the other culture. So, from, so you can do a list of 10, 20, 30 kinds of things that you can introduce gradually into your curriculum from this, uh, so sorry to say, silly example that I did, you know, changing the names, introducing some concepts. Why not? Why not? Yes, sir. Female teachers, were they more sensitive to male teachers or male teachers more sensitive to female teachers? All right, was there at some point just teachers in general as practitioners said, I just cannot do this? Great. The answer is like that. In gender, you know, by, by gender it's a little tough because in Israel most of the teachers are female teachers, really. Although in high schools there are more male teachers than in, uh, in the elementary school, but so forth. But those that were much more tolerant were the homeroom teachers. And I can understand because the homeroom teachers were much more sensitive, but the teachers that teach, for example, math or physics, that they need to be multicultural, they need to relate the multiculturalism to specific topics. Now, I do not expect that teachers will create all these great ideas of how to teach in, in multicultural multicultural terms. They need to be prepared, trained, and committees, do you remember committees? Let's <laughs> <laughs> committees will need to suggest programs, you know, that will include multicultural issues. I really do not expect that the teacher that I uh, just heard that in Georgia they are so well played, paid. <laughs> it's a joke. Now I <laughs> as compared to Israel, you know, because teachers that work so hard with so many kids, now I'm telling, I'm, I'm saying to them, now from tomorrow you're going also to include multicultural and cultural issues by yourself in, in your, I don't know, where, how. So they need to be trained and they need to be guided. And it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. But homeroom teachers were much more, you know, tended to, to, to be flexible and to see at least that cultural, to be culturally sensitive and to support multiculturalism was better. Study, but maybe the homeroom teachers had to get to know the child exactly than they, they need to know to work with them not only in, in the academic you know part section of their brain but with the kids as a whole as, as kids yes and they have much more contact with the parents and when you know the parents you you know you need to be much more culturally sensitive and to think that that is a good 
Aí vem. How much are your, your... I don't have a question, but yes, I, please. Um, I can see many things that you talk about um, being related to, to a class I had once on campus here. It was called a race-related class. And the professor who was raising it from Africa, what she did in her class, um, each of us were in the class, she allowed us to study, to take on the very form and the culture of the, um, the country that we were studying. And um, initially, there were students who said, ah, why do I need to study that? Why do I need to study that? Of course. And at the end, it was it was such a um, great transformation that occurred in the class. Oh, they didn't understand because they talked talk about the, the cushion and, and, the, and the full factors and all these various things, assimilation, and about the various religion, ethnic um, discord that existed within countries and stuff like that. And it opened their eyes just to understand that, you know, things that, that are happening within the United States, um, countries have similar things but in different ways. Mm -hmm. And the class were with a transformed class. Exactly. You know, so I, I can understand completely and even agree that the, at the initial stage is there some kind of, you know, what's that all about? And that's okay. That's okay. And at the, and the end, there is a kind of transformation. Do you remember the, the process? Transformation also in, in the way that you think. Can I make a suggestion? You know, maybe most of the students need to take such kind of courses. Do, do you understand? That, that, that's the only thing. That's the only thing. I find that on campus they're trying to do um, every month they host this thing called dialogue. They talk about dialogue. Yeah. We have that um, on campus here um, that occurs at the International Center. And we have um, international students and local students can come together and there are topics that we can talk about. There's no right or wrong answer, but it opens um, students understand, to understand, okay, what are the perceptions? Exactly. And, and in the states, and I agree with you, but in the, in the state, like in Israel, you don't need international students to have in your class a plural class. Right. Is it okay? Right. You don't need your international students at a different angle, and a, it's okay, great. But you don't need that. You know, it's enough to, to pick. You know, any class, and you will have enough plural right. differences, cultural differences, that you can introduce at least to some extent. And my main point is that if you introduce that and you encourage the students to speak also about the cultural issues, not only about their own families, but how do you culture relate to empathy, to coping styles, to ways to teach, speak. Maybe you, now you don't behave like that. Ask your parents, ask your grandparents, bring into the class as input. Let's discuss, let's say, you know, that's a good idea. No, that's not a good idea, no. It's not alone now. No, ah, let's, wow, I didn't think like that. So it's, it's the relation between being plural and multicultural and from your multicultural perspective, trying to encourage thinking a little bit different about different things. Coke tastes so different in different cultures, okay? It's good business to be multicultural. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We want to thank you, Dr. Tatar, thank for, you so much. for just bringing uh, all these ideas to us. I, I think uh, uh, we, we've uh, heard, first, uh, a lot of great research ideas, and second, a lot of practical application for those. So just one more recognition for our guest, Dr. Tatar. Thank you very much. And again, want to uh, thank Shelley for bringing uh, Dr. Tatar and the uh, uh, Consul General here. Thank you, Shelley. And uh, Consul General, uh, we just appreciate you coming and uh, hope this is just the beginning of a, of a relationship between us and uh, your consulate and uh, also uh, Columbus and, and Columbus State and Israel. So thank you very much. All right, so from uh, uh, COEHP TV, uh, thank you very much to our audience, and uh, we'll see you next time.